exciting. It's about the size of the Sanders class. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the library. On behalf of Mayor Bill Purcell and the members of the Metropolitan Council and also Library Director Donna Nicely and the members of the Library Board, we welcome you to the library. We of course are always delighted to have our very special guest, Vanderbilt University, who brings not only delightful intellectual speakers to nourish our minds, but also the food. And we deeply appreciate that. I bring uh, greetings and, and kind of regrets from Mike Schoenfeld, the Vice Chancellor for Public Affairs from Vanderbilt, who is not able to be with us. So they have left me in charge for a little bit longer which was a bit of a, a problem because uh, I had brought this uh, short book to read as a way of introduction, <laughs> but I discovered I left my glasses behind, so I can't do that. I feel terribly, terribly disappointed on that, as I'm sure you do also. Amen. <laughs> it's good to have a responsive audience for that. I, with that in mind, I shall go ahead and introduce directly Dr. David Wood, who is professor of philosophy and author of that runaway bestseller, Thinking After Heidegger. Yeah. Dr. Wood. Yeah, you must get a copy for the library someday. I mean, an extra copy is what I mean. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome back, new faces and old faces. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, today's speaker, Monica Casper. Monica is a feminist scholar. She's a, a bioethicist, a medical sociologist, and a mom. Um, I won't tell you which she's the greater expert in. Um, but at Vanderbilt, she's most prominently our new director of the Women's Studies Program. Now, programs are not departments. In some ways, they're more important than departments because they pursue their interests and concerns right across the board, wherever these issues arise. Professor Casper is very well placed to pursue these interdisciplinary connections, both as a sociologist with its built-in breadth and also somebody with a growing interest in the scientific and medical questions that her work uh, throws up. It's tempting to describe her as one of a new breed of feminist scholars, someone who uses her passion and commitment, but also her knowledge, to throw new light on the very concrete dilemmas that women are confronted with, both in this country and around the world. But perhaps we need, instead of calling her like a new breed of feminist, just to adjust our image of what a feminist might be. My grandmother was a campaigner for women's rights in the 30s and 40s, that's the last century, and she spelt, spent a whole lot less time chained to railings than in the library reading up on the latest science and statistics. So maybe, you know, new feminists are like the old feminists. Monica Casper's expertise lies in medical sociology. She looks at how women's bodies and lives are impacted by science, by technology, and by medicine. She looks at how we try to balance pregnant women's rights to informed consent and bodily integrity with the growing ad advocacy for fetal rights. And as you'll hear today, she's involved in numerous research projects on comparative practices of sterilization, on the dilemmas of breastfeeding where the milk may be toxic, and on the differential impact of women, on women of our practices of chemical weapons disposal. If ever feminism was in a box, with scholars like her, it's come right out of the box. Professor Casper has a PhD from the University of California in San Francisco. And before we recruited her to Vanderbilt last fall, she was the director of the Intersex Society of North America. Her 1998 book, The Making of the Unborn Patient, A Social Anatomy of Fetal Surgery, 
won two distinguished book awards. And she's since branched out with this, another edited volume, Synthetic Planet, Chemical Politics and the Hazards of Modern Life. We have today a most distinguished speaker who will talk on body politics, looking at science, technology, and medicine through a feminist lens. Please welcome Professor Monica Casper. Thank you so much for coming today. I mentioned to my three-year-old daughter that I was giving this talk today at the downtown library, and she said, is that where the puppet show is, Mom? <laughs> it's very humbling. So I want to start my talk today with an experiment. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine what a feminist looks like. Some of you might see specific people, such as Gloria Steinem or Angela Davis. Others might see a caricature, perhaps a strident-looking woman with sensible shoes. Others might see yourselves, or your partners, or your daughters. Perhaps your feminist is a man. Whomever you see, I doubt that you're all imagining the same person. You can open your eyes now. However, we do live in a time in which 35 years of backlash to the women's movement of the 1960s and 1970s have produced a fairly typical cultural image of today's feminist. And she's more in keeping with the strident woman in sensible shoes than with, say, a heterosexual woman with two children who's married. Indeed, today's feminists are often referred to by some camps as feminazis or man-haters and other inaccurate and inflammatory terms. And there are legions of college students, many who I work with, who have no idea what feminism is or could possibly contribute to their lives. So let, I want to start my talk today by just talking about what a feminist is. And I think to do that, we need to think about what feminism is. So a couple of definitions of feminism. One is the belief that society is disadvantageous to women, systematically depriving them of individual choice, political power, economic opportunity, and intellectual recognition. Feminism is also advocacy of women's rights. Feminism is also a theory of the political, social, and economic equality of the sexes. It is also a doctrine that posits equal rights and opportunity for women and girls. And finally, it's a recognition that women's and girls' experiences matter in the creation of history. So a feminist, then, is somebody who believes in these feminist principles and who puts these beliefs into practice, whether through activism, scholarship, or everyday activities such as mothering. So let me say a few words about feminist research. For many of you taught to believe that science is free of politics, a term like feminist research might sound oxymoronic. How can an activity, science, thought to be about truth and objectivity, be accomplished with and within a political agenda? How can an avowed activist, an activist scholar, produce meaningful, truthful scholarship? One need only consider the history of the Manhattan Project, for example, or more recently, the quest to map the human genome to recognize science as a deeply political project with deeply political participants who care about what they do. In fact, many of us become scholars because we want to change the world, whether we enter biology, physics, sociology, or the humanities. Each of these disciplines tells a particular story about the world that we live in. <clears throat> Excuse me. We use different techniques and methodologies, and we create different project products, but all of us, to one degree or another, are kinds of storytellers. And this doesn't mean that we just make things up. As a sociologist, I know more make things up than a biologist does. But it does mean that I make choices about what I study, whom I study, and how I study particular phenomena. Just as a biologist makes choices about what organism to study, how to approach it, and what stories to tell about it. As a feminist scholar, I make choices to study social and cultural phenomena that have consequences in women's lives. I make additional choices within my projects about who to interview, where to conduct research, and how to frame a problem so that the impact on girls and women is foregrounded. It's a particular way to tell a story in the world. And this is the political part of what I do. And it produces stories that are no less, quote, true than if I foregrounded other participants in other social problems. So my talk today is called Body Politics. And I want to talk a little bit about that term. Although, as David mentioned, I'm trained in medical sociology and bioethics, and I sometimes do describe myself as a medical sociologist, and nobody ever knows what that is, the most accurate way that I can define what I do is to say that I study body politics. 
And what I mean by that is that I'm interested in the way that women's bodies, and men's, but particularly women's bodies, and lives are shaped for better or worse by science, technology, and medicine. And we're now in the 21st century, and we have incredible things happening in the world of science, technology, and medicine. And those are deeply consequential, and they're moving much faster than we can culturally and ethically think about them. And I'm interested in that set of issues. And this places me within an interdisciplinary field of scholarship that we call feminist science and technology studies. My work has focused largely on women's health issues, although not exclusively, and I'm specifically interested in human sexuality and reproduction. Also, as a, sociology, as a sociologist who generally is interested in power, inequality, and social change and justice, I found that there's really no better site of investigation than science and medicine as it's directed toward human bodies. And there's also no better indicator of socioeconomic difference than to look at the status of health of people. If one did a global map of disease, one would get essentially a global map of poverty and inequality. Also, whether in the United States or elsewhere, it's predominantly women's bodies that are marked by techno, what we call techno-scientific innovation and political agendas. For example, the history of reproductive research, including the testing of the birth control pill on women in Puerto Rico, nicely illustrates which women get to be guinea pigs. <coughs> Excuse me. Forced abortions in post ceausescu Romania illustrate the chilling impact on women of antinatalist regimes. And we have seen such politics in our own country as one of the first moves a newly elected president makes in the United States, often on the first day, is to either reinstate, in President Clinton's case, or cancel, in President Bush's case, funding for international family planning efforts. To study body, body politics, then, means to study the ways in which gender, class, race, and sexuality are animated by science, te technology, and medicine in an increasingly global world. And to study such politics as a feminist means to highlight certain questions about women and girls, to study social problems that are in pressing need of social solutions. And feminist research is storytelling, to be sure, but they're stories that matter, and sometimes they matter in terms of life and death. Usually when scholars give talks, we do something called presenting our findings. And I'm not going to do that today because, frankly, I think it's a little boring and dry. What I'd like to do instead is take you on a tour through the minefield of body politics and show you by example what it means to look at science, technology, and medicine through a feminist lens. I've been working on three projects, one for about seven years, one for four years, and one for just a few months. And what I'd like to do is tell you about the projects in a way that shows you how somebody like me or you could study them, could look at them as a kind of social problem. So I'm really doing a kind of methodological talk today rather than giving you findings about each of these, each of these issues. And I'm going to reverse the order. You have an outline in front of you. I'm actually going to talk about chemical weapons last. <clears throat> and I hope I have enough time to do it. I'm going to start with quinacrine sterilization and Assure. So first of all, what are these and why are they interesting? And I should start by saying that I became interested in quinacrine sterilization while I was researching the chemical weapons project because quinacrine is derived from quinine, which is an anti-malarial that was, has been instrumental in many military operations and was historically, particularly in Pacific theater. And I started by thinking of quinacrine, quinacrine or QS as the shorthand, as a kind of military technology as well as a technology for producing um, health or preventing disease. <clears throat> There's long been an interest in finding alternatives to surgical sterilization for contraception. Although sterilization is the most common form of contraception, the surgical part is what makes it complicated, particularly for women. Dr. Jamie Zipper, who is the inventor of the copper T IUD, began researching chemical agents that were cytotoxic or damaging to tissues, but non-toxic to the whole organism. So it would be something that could damage tissues without killing off the organism. And quinacrine was selected because it was already widely available as quinine. It was already out there and had already been approved by the FDA for oral use. But what Zipper realized is that it could be applied to the mucosal linings in the fallopian tubes and it would work as a contraceptive. So the way that it works is that using a modified copper T IUD inserter, seven pellets of quinacrine are inserted into a woman's uterus, high up in, near the fundus, the quinacrine hydrochloride is released and it scars and burns the fallopian tubes and creates a blockage. Okay. <clears throat> quinacrine is used in about 20 developing nations 
and over about 100,000 women have been sterilized, about half of those in Vietnam and in other places like Pakistan and Bangladesh, Egypt, Croatia, et cetera. However, quinoquin, QS, I'm going to say, is not widely used in North America or Europe. The supporters of quinoquine historically in this country have been a group of Americans who are very interested in population control and questions of immigration. So there are interesting political questions that come up around their advocacy of quinoquine in the developing world. Now, quinoquine has become of great interest to women's health activists around the world, largely because it seems like it's not being used in the most ethical ways. And also, it's being used mostly in the developing world and not anywhere else, which is cause for alarm. And there are a number of problems with quinoquine as well, including its safety and effectiveness. It's not very effective. There are a number of ectopic pregnancies that develop after women have been given quinoquine. There's no government regulation. Um, it's deeply connected to broader population control politics that themselves reflect um, unethical politics in particular parts of the world. And women's health activists in other countries see it as very racialized because it's being used on women in developing countries. And the opponents of quinoquine have been somewhat successful in getting it blocked or halted in certain countries. It's now banned in Chile, much to Jamie Zipper's dismay, and a few other places. So I've been researching QS for a number of years, and I think it's interesting in and of itself. But as I was working on the project, I became aware of a new technology that was being marketed here in the West called Assure. How many people have heard of Assure? Anybody in this room? A couple of people. So this technology features two micro inserts. They're very small, somewhat like heart stints. Everybody knows what a heart stint is. They're placed into a woman's fallopian tubes, but they're placed vaginally, so it doesn't require surgery, right? This is not a surgical operation. Scar tissue forms around the inserts over a period of three months. So for three months, a woman has to use a contraceptive cover, creates a blockage, and then prevents fertilization. It's seen to be highly effective, it's relatively painless, it's covered by many insurance plans, and it's rapidly becoming the contraceptive procedure of choice for middle-class American women who don't want any more or any children. In addition, unlike QS, Assure was tested in clinical trials on women in the US, Australia, and Europe. It was produced and is distributed by a company in Silicon Valley in California called Conceptus Inc., I love the name. And it has an extensive website. You can actually look this up, www.conceptus.com. <coughs> in short, it's become the technology of choice for the developed world. So how interesting, I thought, it would be to study quinoquine and, and Assure comparatively. right? Here we had two sterilization technologies being used in two very different parts of the world. So what would it tell us about economics, politics, race, and class when a dangerous and ineffective technology, quinoquine, is tested and used on poor women in the developing world, while a newer, safer, more expensive technology is used by insured women in the developed world? What does it tell us about women's choice, which is a word we hear a lot in this country, when a poor woman in Bangladesh must choose between a damaging sterilization procedure, death and childbirth, or bearing another child she cannot feed and who will likely die before his first birthday. While a middle-class academic in Nashville, who wishes to limit her family size to two daughters, or two sons, or three daughters, or three sons, chooses a sure from a diverse array of technologies and has a generally favorable experience. Right? I'm talking about two very different trajectories in terms of these technologies. What does it tell us about the politics of international family planning when one of the biggest threats to women in the developing world is death and pregnancy or childbirth, right up there with hunger, tuberculosis, and AIDS, all things that folks in the US do not think very much about. What does it tell us about gender and the embattled politics of birth control research in the United States when the hottest new contraceptive procedure is permanent sterilization for women? Hmm, sounds a little old-fashioned, doesn't it? Thereby again eclipsing vasectomy, which is the safer and easier alternative. We also have not researched microbicides or a vaccine, things that look very promising but aren't, aren't being pursued in this country. And finally, what does it tell us about the global politics of health care? That insured women in the US, whose maternal mortality rates hover at about 1 in 1,800 births, are electing cesarean deliveries, while women in the developing world experience death in, quote, natural childbirth at a rate of 1 in 48 births. OK. <clears throat> I said that I would raise a bunch of questions and not necessarily give you answers. So what I'm doing is raising questions about these issues, and then perhaps we can talk about them 
after I'm done speaking. So let me turn to breast milk biomonitoring to raise another set of questions. And I'll tell you that I became interested in the breast milk biomonitoring issue while I was pregnant with my first daughter in 2001. I was determined to breastfeed. I remember sitting at the kitchen table uh, in, in, on Whidbey Island, Washington, where I used to live before moving to Nashville. And I was reading an excellent book called Having Faith by Sandra Steingraber. And I highly recommend anything she's ever written to all of you. And one of the most striking passages described how terribly polluted nature's perfect food really is. And I remember thinking, what a great choice. So I can choose between toxic breast milk for my child or artificial formula. Those are my two choices. And I came back to this topic last summer. I, I was a little busy there after the baby was born. And um, shortly before my second daughter weaned herself, when I learned that Breast Cancer Action, which is a San Francisco Bay Area organization focused on breast cancer advocacy, had withdrawn its support of a statewide program to monitor breast milk. And that seemed really interesting to me on a number of levels. So before I talk about why, let me tell you a little bit more about biomonitoring, which might be a new word for some of you. So biological monitoring, or biomonitoring, measures the presence of trace compounds in humans, usually through analysis of blood, urine, and other tissues and fluids, such as breast milk. And two major reasons to monitor breast milk include understanding the origins of breast cancer, and also learning more about the adverse effects of polluted breast milk on human infants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Biomonitoring is a powerful new tool for environmental health advocates, and there's really been an explosion in this kind of research in the last year or two. Yet the use of that data is very, very contested. The, te the technique is premised on the assumption and understanding that humans and other organisms are continually exposed throughout our lives to naturally occurring and synthetic substances in the environment. Chemicals enter into our bodies when we breathe, eat, drink, um, or have direct contact with environmental contaminants. And some chemicals tend to accumulate in our tissues and fluids and also in our, in our, in our fats. And biomonitoring allows for the measurement of trace amounts that were in the past largely undetectable. So now we have new techniques, largely through biotechnology, that let us see what is living in all of us. And if we were all to do biomonitoring, I think we would be a little shocked when we found out what was living in our bodies. So what scientists can do now using these biomarkers is that they can determine which substances have taken up residence in our bodies and thereby measure the overall body burden of toxins that we carry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Advocates of this technique believe that, data, that this data offers important evidence of the need for environmental health activism and advocacy and more progressive environmental policies. Well, you can imagine on the other side, industry argues that chemicals are a necessary byproduct of modern life. And even if we do have them in us, that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about where they came from or what to do about them. So this is one of those contested areas. And you're probably getting the idea, rightly so, that I'm very interested in studying controversy in places of contestation, because that tells us something about the way politics work in this country. <coughs> I apologize for my, my cough. <coughs> So biomonitoring of human breast milk specifically is of interest to scientists, public health officials, and women's health advocates because of the risks of chemicals to women and to breastfed infants. For example, in the 1980s, and some of you might remember this, reports announced the presence of heptachlorine dioxin, both considered highly carcinogenic and dangerous, in human breast milk, causing a scare that led many women to cease breastfeeding their babies. As techniques for detecting chemicals in fluids have improved, more information than ever is known about the presence of various things in human breast milk. And in fact, just a couple weeks ago, the Sunday New York Times Magazine had a really excellent article about this issue written from the perspective of a, a woman who had just given birth. In 2002, the state of California, which always likes to be on the progressive edge of these kinds of things, initiated a statewide monitoring program to detect chem chemicals in the environment through the analysis of fluids, and they chose breast milk. Bay Area communities such as Marin County and Hunters Point, both of which have very elevated rates of breast cancer compared to the national levels, um, were, were very much in favor of that program. And Breast Cancer Action co-sponsored the bill that brought, um, brought that research to the table. The problem was that Breastfeeding advocates, while generally supportive of the increased knowledge that that might bring, were worried that that study would cause women to stop breastfeeding. And some of you know that compared to other parts of the world, we are already 
well behind breastfeeding rates. I mean, women in the U.S. breastfeed far less regularly than, than other women do. And the women who do breastfeed here are generally done by about six months. <clears throat> so Breast Cancer Action withdrew its support from that program. And it cited as its primary reason the harmful consequences of monitoring on breastfeeding and maternal and child health. Now, if women stop breastfeeding, the argument goes, there's no guarantee that they're protecting their child's health, and they may, in fact, be causing more harm. For example, if women stop breastfeeding, what's their alternative? Formula. And unless they're choosing an organic formula, they're likely getting milk that itself might have been contaminated by some kind of toxin. So we have this controversy that's sort of raging about breast milk. So what kinds of questions can we generate about this topic? Certainly we would want to know more about the history of body burden studies and why breast milk is a particularly good fluid to study. Also we would want to know about the relationship between breast milk biomonitoring and breast cancer research. And then I had a question, which is what do we actually know about breast milk and breastfeeding practices? And has this even been a topic of scientific inquiry? And if not, why not? Why is this something we don't know enough about? Again, back to the gendered politics of bodies. And what can we learn about this complicated issue about social movements that are organized around women's health? How can groups working on breast cancer on the one hand, which is a hugely significant issue to many, many women, work and collaborate with groups concerned about infant well-being? Right? We have two groups here interested in breasts for various reasons who have sometimes competing interests, and that's interesting to me. I think that that's worth studying in terms of how women's groups can learn to collaborate differently in a more progressive way. And finally, what are the political and ethical dimensions of breastfeeding? Why is it that women's choices are limited to formula or toxic breast milk? Why are those our only two choices? Might another alternative be a kind of human rights issue? And thinking about this in terms of the rights of women to breastfeed their children unpolluted milk, and the rights of human infants to ingest unpolluted milk. How does research into the biomonitoring controversy get us closer to an emerging consensus that breastfeeding, breastfeeding could be considered a human rights issue? <laughs> and how might doing so bring together different groups of women, not all of whom might consider themselves feminists? Okay, so do I have time to do chemical weapons, David? Okay, good. You can hear about chemical weapons. The writer J.G. Ballard defined nerve gases as the patient and long-awaited revenge of the inorganic world against the organic. It's one of my favorite quotes about chemical weapons. I started researching the chemical weapons disposal program in 1998. And I was interested not just in the fact that we had chemical weapons, but that, that we were signatories to an international treaty mandating that we destroy our 38,000 ton stockpile. That was interesting to me as a medical sociologist, as somebody interested in peace and war, for any number of reasons. I was also becoming increasingly interested in environmental health issues um, and working on projects that led to the edited volume that, that David talked about, Synthetic Planet. So I decided to focus a research project around controversy at the sites where we are destroying our, our chemical stockpiles. And there are eight of those in the United States. Um, and they're all quite controversial. Um, some are mired in litigation, some are actually very near here. There's one in Kentucky, there's one in Anniston, Alabama. Some of you might know something about this issue. So I visited two of those stockpile sites, um, both before 9-11. Now there are interesting ways that 9-11 has changed this project and my access to that data, and I don't have enough time to talk about that today. Um, but it, was some of the most interesting ethnographic research that I've ever done. Um, I visited a site in Utah and one in the South Pacific and learned to use a gas mask, learned to carry atropine with me at all times. It was a very kind of high-risk ethnography in these fascinating military installations. Um, and gender was very much a part of, of that ethnographic experience, but that too is another story. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about chemical weapons in this country, which some of you may not know much about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have about we had about 38,000 tons. We have we have fewer fewer weapons now because some of the sites have been have been incinerating um, of nerve gas. Essentially, we're talking about nerve and mustard gas, and the 38,000 tons are actual agents, and those are stored in millions of tons of hardware, like artillery shells and rockets and other kinds of things. So part of what the chemical weapons disposal program is doing is destroying 
the agent itself and destroying the military hardware that it lives in. So part of the process is taking the agent out of the hardware, destroying it piece by piece. And because Congress has prevented or forbidden transport of these technologies of the, of the agent, at each site where they've been stored in and around the U.S., they have to be destroyed. So that has meant that we've had to build um, disposal facilities at every site. So the first incinerator was constructed on Johnston Atoll. And one of my informants there told me that it was miles from nowhere, and he was absolutely right. Um, I got on a plane, went to Hawaii, went toward the Marshall Islands, stopped on this tiny little spit of land in the middle of the South Pacific, and got out to a group of men with AK-47s. And it was, again, interesting ethnography, right? It was a different sort of place. So that facility is called JCADS, which is the Johnston Atoll Chemical Agent Disposal System. I'll just refer to it as JCADS. The burning there um, is done, it was finished in 2001, and cleanup activities are now underway. In 1995, a second incinerator was constructed, the Tooele Chemical Agent Disposal Facility called TOCDF, and that's in Utah, near Salt Lake City. Um, similar to the first with a few modifications, and that one is still in the burning phase. Then there are incinerators constructed in Umatilla, Oregon, and Anniston, in Anniston, Alabama. Those were recently completed and are just about to come online, but the, each of them has been, again, mired in difficulties. There's legislation trying to prevent it. There are very active citizens groups um, upset that there's going to be incineration of chemical weapons in their backyard. <laughs> so one of the problems with this issue is that the Army chose incineration as its preferred technology without asking the communities what they wanted. Now, had they asked the communities, my suspicion, based on the folks that I've talked to, is that people might have chosen incineration. There are a number of reasons why, economically and otherwise, it makes sense as the technology of choice, but they weren't given the choice, right? So part of this controversy is because the Army made a kind of um, executive decision, which the Army is pretty good at doing. And it's created the sense that democracy has collapsed at these sites, right? So that's of interest to me. That's one of those interesting questions that I've been looking at. So some of the political activism has impeded progress at the sites. Again, there's legislation. There have been court orders against um, continuing burning at some of the sites. Only two of the sites are using alternative technologies, and that is uh, the one in Maryland and the one in Indiana, and those are neutralization sort of biological agent technologies. So incineration is kind of a funny choice, right? I mean, there are a number of you in the room who probably remember debates in the 1970s about incineration. I mean, that was very much in the news in terms of environmental health politics. Um, we know that incineration poses a number of health problems. There are questions about what comes out of a smokestack when something's incinerated. I mean, does the agent completely get eradicated? Or does something else happen? Um, does it get eaten up or does it come out of the smokestack? Now, the risk assessments show pretty definitively that there's not much coming out of the smokestack. But the people on the ground, the people who live near these facilities, are not that concerned about the risk assessments. Because symbolically, what they see is smoke coming out of a smokestack in an environment where they have been told that they need to have incineration in their communities. Um, and they're experiencing it in quite a different way. So the risk assessments do not mean as much to those folks as their gut feeling about what might be going on with these sites. <coughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So because the Army chose incineration, a number of critics have started to refer to the, um, to the program as instead of chemical weapons disposal, they call it chemical weapons dispersal. And the Army has not been pleased with that, that term, but it's kind of catchy, and it is catching on, in fact. And I think that there are legitimate concerns that the basic obligations of the Chemical Weapons Convention are not necessarily being met. And one of the things the Convention requires is that weapons be incinerated or, or destroyed in ways that are safe and environmentally sound. Um, and there are questions about whether that's really happening in our program. Um, and we are sort of the bellwether program. I mean, if we can do it in the right way, then Russia and other countries with chemical weapons can figure out how to do it as well. So there's a lot writing on this program. So what does chemo chemical weapons have to do with gender? That's what you're all thinking. How is this a feminist issue? And I'll give you a couple of answers um, and then move on to some conclusions. So I think there are three ways, actually four ways that, that it matters. And I'm going to talk more about the first three. The first is that 
In terms of a choice of topic, remember I said at the beginning of my talk that we pick things that matter and that are consequential. And I think that practices in this broad area of security, we've heard a lot about the word security lately, including destruction of chemical weapons, including the other kinds of things we're doing to enhance health and human security in this country, have a lot to do with gender, have a lot to do with women and kids, um, but also have a lot to do with social justice. Like there is a feminist reason behind my interest in this project. So that's one, one answer. The second is that in all of these sites, who do you think are the, women, are the environmental health activists? They're the women, right? It's the women who are protesting what's happening in the, at these facilities. Um, and they're not that concerned with the kind of quantitative language that the Army is spewing at them. They're concerned about having babies with two heads. They're concerned about their husbands dying of cancer. They're concerned about breast cancer. They're concerned about the kinds of things they might be exposed to, right? That's an embodied fear that the Army has not done a good job of recognizing. Now, I don't want the Army to sound like the bad guy here. Part of what's happening is that they're competing what we call discourses, right? The Army has this language of quantitative assessment that doesn't match the language that most of us would think about if we had an incinerator sitting smack in our backyard. I, too, would worry about the effects on my children, right? So the other way that gender factors in here is that we're talking about kids and women, and women are the activists. I mean, I did so many interviews with women in Utah who are really petrified about what's happening there, um, and not being responded to in ways that are allaying their fears. Okay, so that's another way that that, that matters. <clears throat> and then finally, in terms of body politics, I was fascinated to read. Now, I know my fascinations are probably different from yours, but I sat down one night and I read the entire Chemical Weapons Convention. A little light bedtime reading. And not one place in this very long document is the word body mentioned or is the word health mentioned. Now, I think that's interesting. I think it's really interesting that the first document, really since the Geneva Convention, that's international in scope, that promises to rid the world of a very dangerous, very deadly substance, doesn't frame it around people's health and bodies, right? It frames it around tons of nerve agent and tons of artillery and military hardware. So this question of bodies, um, which I'm very interested in, is missing in the kind of official discourse about chemical weapons. So part of what I'm trying to do with this project is to bring what I'm hearing from people on the ground that I interview, whether they're Army officials, whether they're parents, whether they're kids, health officials, trying to bring those discourses together with this official discourse that has essentially erased them and that hasn't considered them. And to me, that is a feminist question because bodies do matter in many, many important ways, and people's fears about this program are because they believe, that these folks in the community believe that the Army is not taking those fears seriously. And then the fourth reason, which I'm not gonna say too much about, is that we've seen since 9-11 a proliferation of discourse about security, right? I mean, it's all in the news. We have Homeland Security, we have security around us all the time. Some really interesting new work um, from feminist scholars globally about what that means for women specifically. Like, what do those discourses mean when we are now expanding the ways that states regulate people's bodies? Um, what does that mean for race and gender? And that's a really big topic, which is why I'm not going to go into it much here. But that's sort of the fourth reason why I include that case study um, among these three today. So, so let me close now so that we can have some time for questions. What I've been describing here is a way of thinking about the world critically. That is, in the face of a lot of information, um, which comes at us fast every day, in a world that's really seemingly gone mad sometimes, how do we not shut down, right? But how do we take hold of a particular social problem and begin to unravel its knots? I think that one need not be a scholar or even a feminist to see the world with the kind of sharp, critical vision that I've been articulating here. All of you know that you first need to understand a problem before you can find a solution, right? You have to understand what it is that you're looking at. So whether you're studying reproduction or breast milk or chemical weapons or you just want to know why the Tennessee state legislator voted a certain way on a certain issue, you can start by asking questions about that problem. And those questions can include things like, how does one aspect of the problem relate to another? What is the problem's history? Well, who cares about the problem? What are the multiple positions or perspectives on the problem? 
what other problems is this problem trying to solve? What other problems is the problem creating? And so on. I've also been talking about a kind of embodied way of being in the world. As a feminist scholar, I know that I don't sit outside of the world that we live in, looking down on it from some Archimedean or godlike vantage. Um, I'm an actual participant in the world, whether that's as a scholar, a teacher, a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, an activist, a gardener. I mean, whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm part of that world. And I still want to make the world a better place for my daughters. I still have that very naive, um, idealistic vision um, that impacts all of the work that I do. Now, a number of feminist scholars have taken up this issue of being in the world and sort of working with what we have. And while I could quote all of them, um, I'd actually rather quote a 12-year-old boy um, whose name is Nkosi Johnson. And for those of you who don't know who this boy is, he died in 2001 of AIDS. <laughs> Excuse me. He was South African, and he was the longest living African child with AIDS. Um, he's recently become the focus of a new book by Jim Wooten, who's an ABC correspondent. Um, very interesting kid. And this is what he told Jim Wooten when asked about life and what we do in our lives. He said, do all you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. And I think that's all any of us can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions before uh, we open uh, the questioning to the floor. Um, and these are these are not. Uh, there's so many concrete questions I'd like to ask you, but I, I'm sure that you'll get that, them as well. Um, the way you present a lot of the uh, the issues that you uh, work on involves kind of balancing one set of considerations against another, unraveling the knots, uh, as you put it. Uh, and this seems to me a really important general way of, uh, you know, addressing complicated questions. The closer we uh, get to looking at things, the more uh, complicated they get. And I can see that as a, as a scientist and as a, as a scholar, uh, we have to look at things from all sides and give them this kind of balance. But I guess I'm, I would like to draw you out a little bit uh, because there must be issues in which it's clear to you that there is a right answer and that a, taking a balanced approach would be a mistake. And I, I'm kind of curious to know whether you would tell us uh, about one or two of those. You know, you, you're, you're constantly saying this on the one hand and on the other hand, but uh, it strikes me that there's a kind of third hand sometimes. <laughs> and you want to say, yeah, but there isn't really much on that left hand. I mean, uh, is this fair or, I mean, can you, get out of your scholarly box and tell us about one or two areas where you think it's pretty clear what the answer is? Yes. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I'll answer it in two ways. One is to tell you a little bit about, um, very briefly, the fetal surgery project that David mentioned. That was my first book. And when I started that project, I was a graduate student which was many years ago, and I had a very simplistic idea about what was going on. And it went something like this. Women good, doctors bad. <laughs> Women good, fetal surgery bad. Now, I haven't shifted all that much on the fetal surgery issue. But what has shifted is that as a feminist scholar who's interested in women's health and women's choices, what I realized was that it wasn't up to me to tell the women what was good for them or not. And what I grew to understand was that I needed to learn more about what was causing some women to choose fetal surgery and not others, and um, how we might make fetal surgery a better practice for the women choosing it. So in that book, I initially envisioned my conclusion saying something like, women good, doctors bad, no more fetal surgery. What happened instead is that it became what I, what I hope and what I think is a very thoughtful discussion of what would need to happen clinically, ethically, politically, technically, in all sorts of ways, for fetal surgery to be an ethical practice for women. Does that make sense? So it's a different way of thinking about that, po that politics question. Now, I can certainly come out and say, chemical weapons, bad. I mean, certainly everybody can say that. <laughs> we want to get, you know, get rid of chemical weapons, right? But it isn't that simplistic. And when I started that project, 
I assumed the army was the bad guy. Now, what I found, um, and in some ways the army is the bad guy, partly because the army did not include people in their decision-making process. So I definitely take them to task for that. Um, but what I've learned is that the army is the army, and the people in the army are doing their jobs. And their job is to meet the requirements of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So they are a little puzzled by all of this activism because they feel like they're doing good stuff. They're actually getting rid of this very toxic thing that exists on our planet. So part of the way that I work is I try to understand all of the perspectives of all of the folks who are involved. So I do a lot of on the one hand, on the other hand. And then typically in the concluding chapter of the book, um, <laughs> which is where we all put our politics often, um, I take a greater stance and I'll say something more direct um, and stronger about, about what I think is the right answer and the wrong answer. Um, what I can say about that project is I think the Army should have involved people in its decision making and I think they were stupid not to. Um, I think they could have saved themselves a lot of trouble and a lot of money had they done so. Um, you know, we live in a democracy. That's how it should have happened and it didn't. Um, and that's something I've said to many of them and will continue to say. Because I think that if they hear it, the next time a big technical decision making has to happen, that they'll think twice and maybe they will involve people more strongly in their decision making. Okay, I'll ask you one, this one more uh, question. It's a bit similar, but it's not quite the same. Um, you talked about um, what you were doing as, as telling stories and you made it clear that it's not just making up stories. Mm -hmm. um, and that what's important are the kinds of selections that you make. I mean, the, the, the questions that you pursue, the uh, issues that you take up. And I, I wonder when you reflect on which ones you do take up, uh, what kind of ethical and political commitments are driving you to choose this topic or that topic? Mm -hmm. uh, can, you, can you tell us what it is that... Uh, has you select this or that kind of topic and, and put aside others that are less interesting? When you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. What principles do you come up with? <laughs> um, I guess I would say I wish it were 100% principle. I would love for you all to think that I'm this deeply, deeply principled person. And, and to some degree, I am. And I care about the things that are happening in the world. And I want to pick things that... Um, have consequence. I think the Quinnerquin project and the Assure project have consequence. Um, 100,000 women around the globe have been sterilized with a very dangerous technology, and that matters to me. And I would like to do something about that, even if it's just telling a story about it that policymakers can then run with and do something about. The 10% that isn't ethical or political commitment is um, sociological fun and investigation. It's that I like to study things nobody else is studying. Um, I am sort of the intellectual grandchild of a man named Anselm Strauss, who's now deceased, um, who taught my mentors at UC San Francisco. And he said, study the unstudied. And he was absolutely right. Um, I like to study things that nobody has even looked at yet. I like it that not too many hands went up when I said, does anyone know about Assure? I like that when I publish this book, it's going to be the first book on quinacrine and Assure. So there is that aspect that isn't quite principle, um, that, <laughs> that um, you know, I'm not going to apologize for, but I, I do like to study, I like to mess around with documents that nobody else has messed around with yet. That's what I like to do, so. Okay. Well, we're going to ask for the questions from, from the floor. Um, there should be, a, there's one mic over there. Is there another mic there? Just, we just have one mic. Oh, there's another mic, yes. Do we, any, any questions? And what's going to happen is that Monica's going to write these down, as usual, and uh, after we've got a little basket of them, she'll try and answer them all at the end. Yes. Um, the lady here in a red, uh, yellow cap? Yes, I want to ask a question about Fentress County, Tennessee. I was doing genealogy down in the archives and some months ago, and I came across all these stillborn babies, and I couldn't figure out why so many stillborn babies. It nearly drove me out of my mind. And the only thing I could think of was they mined coal up there, and the residue must have gotten in the drinking water. But it just went on and on and on and on and on until I had to put it out of my mind because I no longer am an active environmentalist. 
But I just wondered, do you ever go out and dig up uh, dead bodies and uh, examine them, too, to find out something? And okay. if you do, is it any worse now than it was then? Okay, just just hold on to that question then. Mm -hmm. uh, lady here at the front. Yes, it's, it's you, ma'am. Yeah. Have they considered putting another chimney on to refilter the smoke and not scare the community? And the lady behind, yeah. Sorry, there's a good cluster here. <laughs> Enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm a breast cancer survivor, and one of the risk factors in breast cancer is breastfeeding, which I did do. So that, to me, becomes an ethical dilemma. Is it safe to breastfeed if you know you're going to put yourself at risk for ductal carcinoma? Yes. Um, boy. I'm not actually even sure how to ask this question, but I must say um, I was very impressed with your talk. And when David asked his questions, it crystallized for me something that I was thinking, and it has to do with Deborah Tannen and her issues mm -hmm. about women and mm -hmm. the way they think and the way they would use language and men and the way they think and the way they use language. And I couldn't help but be struck by how you seem to exemplify the fact that you can be both very, very scientific in your approach, uh, probably assertive, aggressive, and all of that competitive, and yet it appears to me that what you're doing is thinking and behaving like a woman in the work that you do mm -hmm. and what you're digging up. And I was wondering if you could just comment on some of Tannen's research vis-a-vis um, -vis what you're doing and what you see in, in your work. Is, is there anyone? I think we, we, we should try and give the mic <laughs> <laughs> over here. It's a bit lonely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, you had mentioned a place in uh, Maryland where they were doing disposal properly or approvedly mm -hmm. or so forth. Would you be able to name that site? Was it by any chance Frederick, Maryland? It's not Frederick. It's not Frederick. Okay. It's Aberdeen, yeah. It's the Aberdeen, Aberdeen Proving Ground. Yeah. Uh, this gentleman here. You're obviously a brilliant woman and have produced brilliant works, but unless there's a dialogue between you and the powers that be, I don't think you know, your wonderful works are going to have much success. Have you tried that much, or if you have, has it been successful? <clears throat> okay. Uh, and the lady over here? Uh, how, how do you feel about Larry Summers uh, <laughs> ha, ha, comment on women in science? Well, if my brain weren't so feeble, I might be able to answer that question. <laughs> I think maybe just one, 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 one more question for, for this uh, overburdened list here. Yes, any uh, lady at the back there, yeah. I think I think you have enough. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me work backwards. Actually, so women doctors love them, um, but not exclusively. I think you know. I heard Angela Davis speak the other night. Did anybody get to hear her speak on campus? She's a fantastic lecturer. And one of the things she said was that politics have gotten increasingly complex, and it's not just about identity anymore. We can't assume that all blacks will vote a certain way, or all whites will vote a certain way, or all women will cohere around the same issue in the way that we might have in the past. I think that there was some hope in the women's health movement that women doctors would um, feminize medicine in really positive ways, and I think to some degree they have. Um, but I think there's also something about medical education and the institution of medicine that whether you're a woman or a man, you're still a doctor, and that there are power inequalities that happen between doctors and their patients. So I think gender does matter. It maybe doesn't matter as much as women's health activists had hoped initially, um, and that it really is also about the individual doctor. Um, I've met some fantastic women doctors, and I've also been appalled at some of the things I've heard come out of women doctors' mouths. So that's that answer. Um, Larry Summers, hmm. <laughs> Very unfortunate comments. Um, 
detrimental to women students and women practicing science. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what he intended to say, but what he did say was just dumb. Um, and it was sexist, and I mean, I hate to have my students hear things like that. Um, it's not encouraging to them. I would hate to have my daughters be old enough to really understand what, what he's saying. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think he should have apologized a little sooner than he did. Um, but you know what? We all say things we don't necessarily mean to say, too. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he might have just misspoke. I have said some really dumb things in public as well and had to, had to kind of backtrack. Um, the question about dialogue, uh, I'm really interested in having dialogue with policymakers. Um, when I started the fetal surgery project, what I hoped would happen would be that I would have a lot of interaction with fetal surgeons and that I could work with them as a bioethicist and as a medical sociologist to help show them the way um, in terms of you know, the kinds of unethical practices that they were engaging in. Now, the team that I studied in San Francisco um, don't like me a whole lot. Um, I, you could read the fetal surgery book and you'll know why. They're, you know, it's a good kind of group of cowboy surgeons and they weren't interested in hearing what I or really anybody else had to say. Now, at Vanderbilt, I had a very different experience. My first visit to this campus actually was several years ago at the invitation of the fetal surgery team here um, who were very interested in hearing from ethicists and lawyers and social workers about the impact on women and families and fetuses of these very interventive techniques that they were pioneering. Um, and that was a great experience. I feel like they listened to what we had to say. Um, and the first thing we all said to them was, stop calling this the fetal surgery program. This is maternal fetal treatment. Like the women are present in what you're doing. You have to cut into their bodies to get at these kids, right? So put women back in the picture. And they listened to that. They Not as much as we would have liked necessarily, but they did. Um, in terms of policymakers, I don't know how much luck I'm going to have with the Army. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I published um, a short piece on this project in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I don't know if that's going to matter more than an academic publication in terms of reaching certain audiences. Um, if I get invitations to speak to different kinds of crowds, like this one, then, then I do that, because um, you never quite know who you're going to reach. Um, and any invitation I would ever get to any sort of Capitol Hill anywhere, I would go and I would talk about my work. Um, I, I've done a number of, uh, I've, I've done activism for years as well. I've been on boards of, right now I'm on the board of the Institute for Children, Children's Environmental Health. I've been a breast cancer activist. Um, I've done a lot of speaking around those issues to legislatures and that kind of thing. And if I can combine that with my expertise, then people tend to listen more. Okay, let's see. So the question of dead bodies. I have never dug up a dead body. Um, I'm intrigued. Uh, I think, you know, David and I were talking in the car on the way over, and I think that the kinds of issues that I'm studying lend themselves really well to interdisciplinary work. And I think it would be fascinating, um, and I'll say one other, to give you a little bit of backdrop, one project I'm also working on that I did not talk about today, I'm tentatively calling Canary in the Womb. And I'm really interested in the ways that fetal health and fetuses at risk have reshaped environmental health politics. Um, because fetuses are among our most vulnerable beings. Um, and that's interesting in terms of reproductive politics and all sorts of things. And there is pretty good evidence that fetuses are at risk and that stillborns and miscarriages do happen because of toxins. Um, we have some of that evidence. So I think it would be interesting to construct a study that would include forensic anthropologists um, and other people who are interested in looking at tissues as well as people like me who look at social structures. Um, I don't have the expertise to, to look at a dead body, um, but I think that the stories that those folks can tell would be very complementary to some of the stories that I can tell or that an environmental toxicologist could tell. Right? I could see a team of us working on a particular issue to tell a fuller, richer story um, about a particular problem. Um, the chimney issue, there have not been many modifications made to the basic design of the chemical weapons facility. There's a little bit of recalcitrance um, among the Army folks and the design folks. Um, after JI was built, um, it had a lot of problems after JCAS was built, a number of problems. Um, so many that you would think that when TOCDF was built that it would have been drastically changed in design. It wasn't. It was almost 100% replicated. So there's something about um, the Army has this thing called Lessons Learned Program, the LLP. 
And I don't think they're learning enough lessons or paying enough attention to those lessons around the design question. And I'm not sure that, a, that an additional chimney would make the public feel better. I think that there is such a fear among communities everywhere about environmental toxins, partly because we don't really understand them. They're hidden. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what they're going to do to us or when. It's very mysterious. Um, and if you have a smokestack looming over you, even a structural change isn't going to get at that basic fear. Um, my argument, I think, um, in the direction that I've been moving in with this is that the fear has to be addressed in a non-technical way because all of the technical ways that the Army has tried to address it have been unsuccessful. I mean, the public is not paying attention to risk assessments, but they might pay attention to citizen participation. They might, if they have a greater role in the decision making, if they can understand more about what's happening. Um, so that's the answer to that. The breastfeeding and breast cancer question I think is really interesting. Um, I was over 30 when I had both my kids. I was 35 when I had Mason, my first daughter. And I was told that a risk for breast cancer for me was that I had not given birth um, before age 30 and that breastfeeding might mitigate some of that risk. So I think it's interesting, and I don't really know enough about that connection yet, um, that we would have two different um, answers about that. Um, and of course, as a sociologist, that intrigues me. That means I want to go look at that and I want to say, what do we know about breastfeeding and breast cancer? Um, who is at risk and who isn't? And how would that factor into the bigger picture? And I think, I mean, breastfeeding is such an intensely personal decision and also cultural. I mean, any woman who's going to do it needs to have, needs to want to do it, needs to have the support, needs to have everything in place. Um, and if it increases your risk for breast cancer, that would definitely be something that you would think about. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one thing I want to find more about. And then finally, this question about Deborah Tannen, um, whose work I really like. And for those of you who aren't familiar with her work, she's interested in communication patterns between men and women. Um, and her first book, I think, was called You Just Don't Understand. Is that right? Um, which <laughs> I've certainly said to my husband. Um, I'm sure my husband has said to me any number of times, but I've probably tuned him out. I think that there are, <laughs> I mean, there are different patterns in the way that we communicate. Um, and I think that I certainly communicate more like a woman. Um, I'm also a kind of nice Midwestern girl from Chicago. So there, you know, there's that aspect of it, too, that there are ways that we behave um, around our work. And I, I think that it's both of an advantage and a disadvantage. And I'll, I'll kind of answer it in that way. It's an advantage as an ethnographer, because part of what ethnography does, in addition to just spending time in a place to understand that place, is that you interview people. And you don't interview them necessarily across a table. You interview them while you're playing pool with them, while you're having a drink at the local club, while you're um, sitting in their living room with their wife and kids. And to have that kind of warm demeanor that draws people out is a huge advantage in ethnography. Um, that I have taken advantage of a number of times. I don't mean that in an opportunistic way. Um, but I think that that kind of style makes one a better ethnographer. Um, and there's some really interesting work in the methods literature about gender and ethnography and how women can do it better in certain ways because we've been taught to have that sort of um, approach to life. Um, gender has factored in other ways. I sort of hinted at the gender nature of the Chemical Weapons Project. I mean, when I went to JI, it was about 65% men. And they were thrilled to have new blood on the island. I mean, I walked off that plane in a group of 2,000 people, and I talked to, I think, every man on the island. Um, and I got fantastic data um, at the pool table, at the pool, you know, in, in these various settings. And I think that there are some interesting ways that gender was working there um, in terms of what these men were willing to tell me. I mean, I have some of the best data of my life, of my career, came from that particular site. Um, it's a disadvantage to have the demeanor that I have and to be my height and my appearance and um, diminutive in certain ways um, in teaching sometimes um, in, a, in a room where one wants to project a certain kind of authority, right? There's a kind of balance between gender and authority that, um, that is at play in our society. Um, men are automatically granted an authority that women aren't. And I think women have compensated for that by taking on um, more masculine characteristics in the way that, that we do our work. And I haven't really done that. that that's not me. So um, I do kind of strike that balance in my life, for better or worse. So I don't want to play the, the, the spoiling man. <laughs> But we're going to have to stop. This is a wonderful uh, session. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.